The first question that I have is, do you have any insights into the level of community engagement that are required for the COVID application for October 9th? I've never heard the ministry speak to any kind of standards on any of these questions. I think they're looking for a, uh, a compelling description of what you did within the time constraints that were available and your recognition of what the next steps would look like. So, um, you know, the, the, as I said before, this is a multi-year journey. And if you are new to engaging Francophone populations, and especially if you're going to be starting to work with Indigenous communities, those are very, very long-run initiatives to build that comfort level and that trust. So I think what I keep hearing is they want uh, transparency about the robust processes you've used to date and where that got you to, but also a sense of what the future holds. So my, I've never heard anybody articulate a specific target, just that they are obviously looking for you to go as far and as fast as you can in the limited, very limited time that you have available, and that you have a clear implementation plan that will take you forward from there. Jeff. Well, I'd just like to, um, first of all, thank you and your team for, I think, putting together um, exceptionally readable and useful briefs um, that, are, that are providing a really strong source of information for this effort. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have is around uh, the co-design of interventions yep. um, and balancing what has worked locally with best practice evidence um, that may, may transmit some, may, uh, may transfer locally in some ways and not others, yep. and how to balance um, some of the competing pressures around things that we've done well here that may not have had the resources to be evaluated by evidence. And just if, can you speak a little bit more about how, for many of us, we're probably in some of the co-design work yeah. and how to evaluate evidence um, and what kind of programs we can build on that. Absolutely. So, you know, it's a, it's a perennial question, and I think, as I, I alluded to before, I think at this stage you want to go do as much as you can in this incredibly tight window and signal that you have tried to draw on the available evidence, but you have also meaningfully engaged patients, families, and caregivers and tried to come up with kind of that magic and built on the rich experiences locally. So, you know, often people talk about those three different pieces, the local contextual knowledge and experiential knowledge, the kind of patient piece and the research evidence. But then to be open to the fact that what's likely going to happen, and I think we should prepare for it explicitly, is as I mentioned before, we find out that 17 teams have all focused on adults with mental health conditions. And one of the first things I think we need to do then is line them up and say, okay, maybe we all look at slightly different evidence. Maybe there are legitimate experiential insights that are unique to your community, but let's have that conversation. And I feel like we, in the early days, were tipping the pendulum towards everything is local. And I think over time we'll, we'll, we'll figure out what is that sweet spot between standardization and locally contextually adapted stuff. So right now we're tilting towards local, but there are going to be many opportunities in future for the standardization conversation. So everybody knows you have very limited time. I think if I were an external examiner, I would want to look to make sure you had really thought, really done co-design you tried to look at the evidence and you'd honored the local experiences and you came up with your first cut and your implementation plan spoke specifically to trying to broaden the conversation if you proceed forward to try to work with other groups to think about where standardization is appropriate and where it's not. So I would put what you can do in the time in that section and in the implementation, I would get into the standardization conversation. That's just my two cents. So, Carrie, anything else online right now? So, other folks in the room? I don't know if any of you remember it. Is it Bugs Bunny that there's that there's a little cartoon with the guy that has the frog, and the frog performs when he's alone, but then it doesn't perform otherwise? And in a lot of the sessions, everybody sits there very quietly, and then the thing that gives us a kick is the moment we turn on the mic, we get all kinds of stuff. But the bad thing is we've got 30 people uh, online who would love to hear the conversation. It's just uh, there's something about not being audio recorded that helps you have slightly more frank conversations. But So that said, anybody else with any questions, comments that they want to talk about? Yes? Uh, just, uh, we've had one uh, uh, 
health team meeting with the, many of the stakeholders in our area. Yeah. And although we're not allowed to ask a policy question, until we know what the funding model is, yeah. we've got 14 stakeholders in the room. Until that funding model is put in place, how does everyone know where they're, I don't know if the right word is packing order or whatever, but until you have that aligned, a lot of these are great ideas, but you can't move forward until you know who's steering the ship. So that, that's just me sitting generically in a meeting listening to these comments. Yep. And uh, you know, when you have a hospital, CCAC, and mental illness, they all have a different agenda. So yep. but once you have that funding model, I think it doesn't mean people are going to be bullied, but they'll, you'll have an idea of which, which way the ship is going, how persuasions go a certain way. Do you have any comments on that? Not the policy part, but yeah. the logistics of how you organize that. Yeah, I guess I, I, you know, I might be missing something, but it's not clear to me what kind of insights you're going to get from the funding model that will help you with the resource allocation. So the, it's hard to imagine that the funding model isn't going to be some sense of, of you know, weighted per capita payments. Uh, that's me guessing just by watching what tends to happen with these models and we know from the guidance document it's going to come in through a single funding envelope but then the magic in this model is that then local communities are going to have those conversations about then how do they allocate the resources that's why I come back to the trusted relationships we have to figure out how do you get people from their own agenda to a shared agenda and collaborative governance is all about that. So I sit on the board of a mental health organization and my focus is what is right for my organization and our clients. Or I sit on the hospital board and I'm focused on my hospital and our clients. What collaborative governance is is saying we have to come together and agree on a set of shared goals and we have to make a have an approach to making decisions that we can all live with. And we're going to make those decisions collectively. And the mental health folks are going to have a voice, but hopefully over time they've come to realize they can trust the hospital and the primary care docs and other people to make, best, make decisions that are sensitive to the needs living with, uh, for folks living with mental health and substance use problems. So I don't know that the funding is going to help us make these tough decisions. I think we have enough sense of what the architecture is going to be, which is we're retaining independent voluntary governance of boards. This is not forced mergers, but those groups are going to end up with a single envelope and they are being given discretion in figuring out what does collaborative governance mean for them, what rules make sense. And everything we've heard is don't pre-specify that final architecture of how you will make those decisions. Just take incremental decisions to build the trust. Maybe start with the one pager at a high level about how you're going to make decisions, how you're going to allocate resources, and then build up to it over time. So it, this is not a top-down driven transformation. This is a transformation where the broad architecture is being described and then local communities are being given the leeway to operationalize it in ways that make sense to them. So that's my answer. I don't think you're going to get more clarity once you see the funding about how to make those decisions around the team table. Yep, Jeff. So one more. Um, so again, a, a one comment and then a, a, a follow-up question. Um, just in terms of the timeline, one of the one of the challenges is the board sign off, and and um, that what that does is it backs up the October 9 deadline to right. mid September. So yeah. it's sometimes the course correction and the learning that we um, need to be doing will interfere with that timeline. So I appreciate that once we get past the October 9 uh, timeline. Um, there will be some things to do, but it's just gonna it's gonna be tough in the in the last half of September and early October to make any substantive uh, changes. Yeah, no, good point. So, and that's probably important just for the ministry to hear that not only is October 9th very close, but in fact, when you back it up, you're having to lock stuff down by early to mid September. So, you know, again, very helpful context setting for them with the evaluation. They know it's a tight timeline. They know this is huge. They know it requires fundamentally different ways of working with folks. So all of that surely is going to factor into their review of these uh, these applications. And then, and it wasn't a complaint. It was more like that. That's just for the landscape of Absolutely. how we introduce yep. uh, information to folks. Yep. And then the other question, and I've, I've talked with you a little bit about this, is the the home and community care piece of this, which is I think the real one of the really 
um, hidden opportunities yep. of the of the transformation, um, and just um, some of the integration between the historically kind of home care and the community social supports that is, that are possible. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could um, a if, if if you're planning on doing any work on that because it would be really helpful I think for communities to see the different possibilities uh, that are out there. Yep. Um, and b do you know about any um, kind of best practice models that are already out there that could help us uh, think about that. Right. So I guess I'm going to answer with two parts to the question. So one is, uh, and people, you know, you might disagree, and I'm, I'm open to having the assertion contested, but I read Appendix A as, as a government, they are thinking about how do they think about what the future of home care looks like. And they are taking advantage of this process to say, hey, if you guys are thinking about this, we'd love to hear your thoughts, which will then feed into any future policy that we develop on home care. So to me, it's kind of like an optional, if you're willing to spend time on it and share your insights, then share them. And at the margin, you will hopefully inform that policy development process. But I think there are going to be many opportunities for you to do that. Uh, how I would, where I would focus my energies would be more with your year one priority populations. As you start to think that through, how do you want to be able to draw on home and community care to meet the needs and address the barriers to access? And that's what matters the most because that's what you're going to have to implement. And then having done that, if there are insights that you're willing to share with the ministry in Appendix A, great. But given everything you have to do, I don't know that my first priority would be spending a huge amount of time thinking about how to redesign home care for the whole province. I would just think about how am I going to draw, how, what do I need to reconfigure so those assets that are, were in the CCAC then are in the LINs, if some of those assets could be better brought into primary care practices or better brought into other environments to enable you to meet, better meet the needs of the population segments that you've prioritized, that's what matters. And that's what you'll implement in year one. And then meanwhile, put that in Appendix A, just saying, hey, when we work this through, we realize this would be helpful. It would be lovely if you'd think about this when you're thinking about what the future of home care is. So that's how I read the application. But that, again, it's my interpretation of it. So, and, and then back to your question about whether, whether we're planning to do anything. We're not per se, because we perceive this as being kind of a policy development exercise, and that's not our role. Our role is to get the right resources in front of teams to help them. So if someone said, we're really struggling with what are optimal ways of bringing in home and community care uh, to support adults with mental health conditions, and if it turned out a bunch of teams were focusing on adults with mental health conditions, we'd quickly do a rise brief on it because it fills your need. But the ministry has many resources it can draw on to inform policy development. So that's not something that we're being asked to prioritize. Okay. Any other online, with all those folks online, no questions. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's a discussion of this digital guideline. Yes, we're all, we're all we're waiting, waiting for it. I'm yes. just curious if anyone here uh, has heard more about we, so I thought it was coming this week, but I, like all of you, I you know I hear rumors and I never know. So I keep hearing it's imminent. So in a webinar last week, uh, you know there was a brief introduction to it, which suggested to me it was coming relatively quickly. But I don't have insights on any of these topics that aren't available to you. But my sense is it's coming soon. I you know I, I would assume that. The ministry realizes how essential that document is for all the thinking that's going to have to happen about digital health, and it's slowing down any working groups that are focused on it. So my understanding is imminent. Other questions or comments? And and I would encourage you also to you know it's question and answer, but if you think that there are uh, things that are happening on your teams that other folks could benefit from, it would be very helpful to hear them. So, Wendy, you, if you're open to it, uh, it might be helpful just to talk quickly about IDS and where you're going in terms of that resource. So, we've been in some communities that are using it already and are thrilled by the 
how it captures the longitudinal patient journey and how you're able to capture CH community health center data, a variety of different stuff. And, and then they ask questions like, are inter assessments captured? And we say yes. And so a lot of people are kind of waking up to some of these data assets that might not have been on their radar. And you and I have also talked about the potential in the long run to add data from community-based resources, perhaps building on the Toronto community data uh, asset. Would you be willing to talk about where you are with uh, IDS and how that might be able to help teams? Yeah, so, um, yeah, happy. Thanks, John. Um, so for the folks that are in sort of central uh, Ontario and down all the way to Windsor, um, they participate in uh, a data sharing um, exercise and a repository uh, and set of tools uh, called IDS, Integrated Decision Support Systems Intelligence Solutions, but it's a short form IDS. It uh, has all of the, um, what I call the hospital administrative uh, data sets, so looking at acute, ED, day surgery, medical daycare, uh, complex continuing care, acute mental health, um, and inpatient rehab, and the related uh, inter eye assessments that go with those. It also brings in the home care, so the uh, CRISP data and the uh, inter-I and RI home care assessments there. Community health center data, the CHCs, uh, we don't have all of them across that area, but we have um, 12 uh, currently in and are bringing in some more as we speak. And um, we have then um, sort of started to have discussions. Um, we have a pilot with EMS data going. We have a discussion with the uh, community mental health going. Um, at our last population uh, uh, digital health one, we had a few people come forward uh, from the Hamilton area around uh, more community data uh, to bring in a, and partner. And we link that data in a longitudinal record. And so um, if you really think about what John was saying earlier and trying to identify those, those populations you might want to focus on, and decide and say it is older adults with uh, mental health substance abuse. Um, we have all of the data sets to contribute to that and it's linked to anything else. Are they not before and I missed we have primary care data coming in. We've created a minimum data set uh, from uh, of primary care data and there are about 65 physicians um, from the McMaster Family Health Team who are contributing data. Um, and I have some conversations going with the Well Family Health Team and a few others that are now interested. And so you can actually see that longitudinal record um, for any encounter that older adult with substance abuse and mental health might be having in the system. And what's nice about that is um, let everything related to that patient in terms of you know, where they live, what region. So you have your attributed population and you can actually drill right down to a census tract division. Or a subdivision, look at where those patients are. You know, maybe you want to cluster activities or interventions or satellite clinics or whatever. You can start to do it that way. Yep. We also have um, Census and Ontario Marginalization Index programs into IDS. And so you can start looking at that social uh, demographic side of things. So we talked about is there residential instability in that area, yep. um, material deprivation, you know, is, is it low income, et cetera. And you can start to pair those two things together with the um, with the clinical activity that's happening uh, Super. in the healthcare. Yep. So um, open for anyone to give me a shout. Um, we're always happy to take more data in. <laughs> Great, super. So, you know, one of the things that has come up in every single community we've been in is people's anxiety about how, um, you know, the, the metrics that they're seeing, they're worried, they're worried that they're driven by hospital data. And everybody wants to know that we're on a path to a platform that captures a longitudinal journey. So you can see someone bounce from hospital to whatever, to other things, but also that there, we're capturing that full spectrum of care. So um, in the data analytics brief, we talk about IDS, we compare it to IntelliHealth and point out the advantages of IDS. And I'm not selling particular solutions, but every community is going to have to figure out what is the data platform that covers all sectors and covers them in a longitudinal way and is very timely in order to allow them to make these decisions. So to me, it's a key part of the digital health backbone. Um, and so as when we get the digital health playbook, 
what you know, I, I don't know that they, that it's appropriately represented there. But over time, communities are going to need to figure out how you either do this or you do something else. But you have to have that integrated data platform in, a, in order to make the right decisions. Yeah, and um, I have uh, seen the playbook, and, and it's really more um, the ministry's access. Yep. It's a great starting point. Yep. Awesome. Um, I'm having some conversations with Virgin, too, of it. Super. Um, with things um, like IDS and other things. There's other things that folks have done across the province. Yep. Um, and the idea being is, um, you know, it's, it's a shared resource that everyone could capitalize on um, without having to invest starting all over again and really. a lot of yeah. money. And, 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 and that's where I don't wear my IDS hat or my Amazon Alliance hat. I just wear my taxpayer hat. Yep. It's, it's sort of the right way to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. And another example of an asset to build on would be, I can't recall what CBI stands for, but the community uh, data uh, set that was put together in yeah, Toronto, Toronto Central. Central. So it, I think it was put together as a pilot, but unfortunately never grew to every limb. But they put together all the data and all the, the home and community, or the community-based uh, organization data, hugely important. And in an ideal world in future, we integrate that into a platform like IDS. But there are these assets out there that are going to be key. Um, and especially when we move to population um, health management, we need unbelievably great data analytics to understand these populations and to understand whether we're moving the needle for them. Yes. So just, yeah. to, just to confirm, are the public health units their data is also included in this? Or so they're currently set up as users of the data. They're not submitting anything yet. So then that'll be part of this whole discussion as to, you know, which is the most important pieces of information to put in. Especially if we start to maybe not year one, because year one is, is really going to be that focused on those metrics, which are, for better or worse, um, hallway medicine type metrics. But when we start to get into the preventative aspect of things, some of that information is going to be really important because you want to catch those rising risk people before they become the people that are the, the problem that you have to really deal with, right? So yeah, so we'll have those discussions. Right now, they just sort of use the information as opposed to submit some of their information. Yeah, but there's, there's no difficulty in bringing that information in. No, no, it's really just having the conversation of what are the pieces you want um, and setting it up as, as a feed. Um, and then um, generally it tends to be more the education and training of everybody using it on, on what is it and how to use it the best way. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it, it's, it's been a growth over a number of years and so it will continue to grow, um, I'm hoping. Another example of, um, you know, some other, another uh, thing that in this part of the province um, has attracted attention is the involvement of municipal government. So yesterday in the meeting in London, folks were saying, gee, we hadn't thought about involving municipal government. Do you think, it would? and they had a very particular way in, and the way in was, which I hadn't thought about, was municipal governments often have a sight line to the future in terms of, you know, what businesses are they trying to grow, and like kind of more of a forward orientation, whereas transit going, where is planning going, where is business going? Um, and I said, well, yeah, I guess that would be helpful. But to me, why they're much more helpful is the housing and the human services. And, and some communities like Hamilton have integrated their human services budget, which just means all you need is one person who can then suddenly talk about an array of assets that can be brought to the table for folks with particularly high needs. So um, well, we've identified that as something that folks might want to contact you, Jeff, and perhaps Paul Johnson about it in Hamilton, but that's another example of something happening locally that other folks find interesting. So when you think about, you know, whether it's Hamilton or any of the other teams that you interact with, if they're doing stuff that you find neat, please get it out because folks are really interested in learning from who's doing innovative stuff that they can draw from. Uh, 58 domains, remember 58 domains where you're going to need to make choices. People can't be experts in all of them and if you have solutions in many of them, they can look at them and say, well, that'll work exactly for us or we'll adapt it or, well, we, that won't work, but it at least gets us thinking. Uh, that'll be very helpful for folks. So, Carrie, any final uh, just a comment from someone from the Northumberland uh, OHG that yep. said that they managed to bring their municipal this municipality. Fantastic. Um, and with that comes the involvement of paramedics and long-term care homes. Super. So it's yep. been really beneficial. Excellent. Fantastic. That's great. Any other questions or comments from folks in the room before we uh, close off the WebEx?
recording part. So last call. All right, so for those of you joining online, thank you very much for joining us. We're just going to close off the WebEx session. The uh, recording will be posted uh, within a few days, and the slides are already up there. So uh, thank you very much.